It's often my practice when I start to prepare a sermon to talk over the gospel reading with my family at dinner time or with my wife over coffee in the morning. So the other day I said to Carol that this week's uh, sermon or gospel reading had to do with Jesus healing the sick and casting out demons. And she immediately responded, Priest, heal thyself. To which I said, First I'll cast out my wife's demons. Fortunately, Carol has a good sense of humor. This morning, I'd like to share a few thoughts about dealing with demons, both on an individual and a collective level. It might seem odd at first to be talking about demons in this day and age, but consider for a moment the experience of being possessed by an emotion, an idea, or by an addiction or a passion. What I find most disturbing this past year is the appearance what seems like a collective possession in our country and around the world. Historically, we have seen the danger of this kind of possession in Nazi Germany. On January 6th, it was a shock to see people swarming into Congress to try and overturn the results of an election. And in some cases, with the desire to try to kill politicians who were seen as satanic child abusers. It raises the question of how we can come together again as a nation with a diversity of political views. How can we deal with one another when it seems that we can't even agree on basic truths? Two of Jesus's more radical teachings seem to me to be a good starting point. The first is to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us. It's such a familiar teaching but that one is so difficult to practice, to actually practice. Yet to do so changes the whole dynamic between ourselves and others and opens the possibility for real human connection. The second teaching speaks to my wife's admonition to heal myself before I try to cast out her demons. Jesus tells us, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? First take the log out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So we begin with ourselves, with our own demons. One of the most striking and common experiences of this kind of possession happens when couples fight. One of them gets set, set off and starts an argument or a fight, or even at first just a charged discussion. But as soon as our partner gets triggered, it's only a short time before that triggers us. And before you know it, there's a full-blown war going on, and neither side wants to give in. We recognize that we are possessed by the fact that we can't stop fighting, and that there are hurtful things you shouldn't say, but you can't help yourself. And you feel that you have to have the last word. You have to win this battle. Afterwards, when you're no longer in the grip of a possession, you wonder what got into you, and most people feel sorry for how they've behaved. What we don't usually recognize was that a demon, or to use more modern language, an autonomous psychic complex has taken us over. These psychic complexes operate in us as autonomous beings, capable of interfering with the intentions of the ego. They have a life of their own and they operate just like what we understand as demons. To use a more extreme example, I remember some years ago, a young man came to see me because he was becoming more and more isolated socially. His problem was that often when he was with a group of people in a social setting, he would all of a sudden shout, shut up. He couldn't stop doing this and he had no idea why it was happening. And so he began avoiding being with other people. I suggested to him that the next time he was in a social setting, that he pay very close attention to what was going on inside his head. That is to listen to his inner voices and especially to know, to see if he recognized any of them. When he came back to see me, he said he was amazed at what had happened. He said that when he listened to the inner voice, he realized it was telling him what a worthless person he was and how no one wanted to be with him or no one wanted to talk with him. 
The voice just went on and on in this manner, berating him. What surprised him even more was he realized that it was his mother's voice he was hearing, and he remembered how she had said these kind of awful things to him as he was growing up. It became clear to him that he wasn't yelling shut up out of the blue, but that what he was trying to do was stand up to the inner mother complex, telling it to shut up so he could get free and live his life. Now, his was an unusual example, but we all have, or have had, a version of that inner negative voice that can take possession of us and diminish our quality of life. The Persian saint Hafiz refers to this when he writes, Once a young woman said to me, Hafiz, what is the sign of someone who knows God? I became very quiet and looked deep into her eyes and then replied, My dear, they have dropped the knife. Someone who knows God has dropped the cruel knife that most so often use upon their tender self and others. It may seem like this doesn't apply to us, but the reality is we all have experienced that knife that hurts us and others. We all have autonomous complexes that take us over. We all have demons that sometimes take possession of us. So how do we get free from these inner demons? How do we drop the knife? Good combats evil simply by its presence just as the presence of light dispels darkness. And this is the key to freeing ourselves, to bring unconscious complexes to the light of consciousness. The light of consciousness makes the complex visible and over time frees us from its power. The very nature of possession is that when a complex or demon gets triggered, it takes us over and we are completely identified with it. Whatever emotion this engenders feels like our true feelings, and the complex itself feels like us. But when we can begin to recognize that we are caught, and we can name the demon, for example, that's my I'm a useless human being complex, then we gain a little bit of distance from it. It may still have a hold on us, but we are no longer completely identified with it, and we can begin to get free. This doesn't happen all at once, but each time we bring it to consciousness, we lessen its hold on us. So the question is not, do I have demons? The question is, what are my demons now, and how can I get to know them? Our demons show us where we are stuck. They show us the things in our present and in our past that need to be faced and dealt with, so that we can be more truly ourselves and be more available for real relationship with ourselves, with one another, and with God. And then there are times when no matter how much insight or how much goodwill or good intentions we have, there are demons that are just too strong for us. Then we have to call on a power greater than ourselves for help. What amazed the people about Jesus was that here was someone who had power over these forces of darkness, someone they can turn to in our time, that we can turn to in our times of need, someone who can set us free. Jesus came not only teaching and preaching about the kingdom of God, but he came with an authority. He enacted the kingdom. With him and in him, the kingdom is present and the people are healed and set free. My prayer for all of us in these difficult times is that we might begin to recognize our demons and to name them, to bring them not only to consciousness, but to God, so that we might be free to live more abundantly and free to love our neighbor. In his name, amen.